Hello and welcome to Tank and AFV News. My name is Tom and today we are, as we usually are, looking at books. Uh, today we are looking at British Zimmerit by Andrew Hills. Um, this is part of his own uh, sort of self-publishing efforts and we've reviewed uh, a number of his books before if you've watched this channel. So uh, the last one we did was his uh, part of his Pioneers of Armor series on uh, R.E.B. Crompton. Before that, it was Robert McAfee. So these are guys that are involved with sort of early armor development. Um, he's also re done some reprints of old manuals. So here's the one for the old um, Whippet, World War, and the Tog manuals. And then, of course, his biggest work is the massive... Uh, Tog book that he did uh, a couple years ago, so which we reviewed. So, just wanted to promote those again because uh, just want to spread the word to some of the stuff Andrew's doing because I, I always like to support people who are doing their own sort of research projects and looking at topics that might not have the same mass appeal that some of the stuff some of the larger publishers is do are doing. So that said, um, his latest book, this one came out in early July, so it's been out for about a month now, is uh, British Zimmerit. Um, and so anti-magnetic mine and camouflage coatings 1944 to 47. Now of course most of you will say wait Zimmerit was a German development and, and most people who watch his channel I'm, I'm sure are probably familiar with it um, but uh, about halfway through the war the Germans started putting uh, this sort of compound on the exterior of their tanks um, called Zimmerit which was supposed to protect against anti- or against anti-tank mines that were uh, magnetic. So the irony, though, being that really it was only the Axis countries that were developing magnetic anti-tank uh, uh, weapons. So the Allies, for the most part, went more the route of uh, coming up with ways of, of, of projecting or throwing an anti-tank warhead, a uh, hollow-charge warhead at vehicles, so whether it be the U.S. Bazooka or the British Piat, um, Soviets, of course, are sort of stuck with their anti-tank rifles. Um, so it was kind of one of those German efforts that ended up uh, really, you know, by the end of the war they had dropped it because it wasn't really protecting against a threat that existed. It was a, a threat that they thought the Allies were going to develop and use, and they didn't. But anyhow, the British, of course, as you do during a war, they captured examples of these German tanks with this coating on it and figured, um, you know, they first they had to try to figure out what it was because they weren't exactly sure, and um, then try to replicate it and improve on it and see if it was something they could use themselves. And that's what this book's about. It's it's about the um, the British efforts and tests to recreate and or improve upon uh, the Zimmerit uh, compound. And this book goes into pretty fine detail about those efforts. Um, Andrew has really dug into the archives on this one to uh, really provide uh, as much information as probably anyone will ever need uh, on these tasks. So um, let's get into this one. Uh, so uh, FW, FWD Publishing is his company, so that's in case anybody wants to look up their Facebook page. The book itself is available on Amazon, by the way, so... Um, fourteen ninety five, which for is it a hundred and hundred and almost two hundred pages. That's 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 not bad for for four, for fifteen dollars. I don't think. Um, and so of course you know as you'd expect, there's an introduction. It explains kind of overview of the threat, which the the magnetic uh, mine threat uh, as it was developed by the Germans. There's a, a picture of it there. Um, as well as some of the different sticky grenades and bombs that people made, and the Japanese uh, med med magnetic mine as well. Uh, and then it just really dives into uh, an examination. So if people are interested in, in just Zimmerit, the, the German version of it, there's quite a bit of information in here, as obviously the British uh, tested it and d did their best to recreate it. Um, and then just tried a whole bunch of different materials. So most of the book is just kind of going through all those different test results. And you know, I'm not going to get into it because, frankly, you know, I read the book and then you try to remember it all as so you're leaving back through and it's like, oh my God, you know, there are so many different things they tried and tested. But, you know, if you're interested, you can buy the book yourself and you can read it. Um, but, you know, there's tons of data and charts in here. There's some interesting photos. So 
Uh, this one I just thought was interesting because the Sherman tank that they were using for, for testing some of the compounds that they were trying. Uh, this is extremely early Sherman tank. Um, as you can see, it's got the M3 style return rollers. It's got the M2 75 millimeter gun with the, the counterweight attached. Uh, it'd be interesting to know what ever happened to that vehicle because that was really almost sort of a pre-production or extremely early production Sherman. Um, yeah, there's quite a few pictures of it. So if you're just into pictures of, of kind of unusual Sherman tanks, the book's almost worth it for that. Um, you can see they also used a Churchill for testing different properties. And what's interesting is they kind of went beyond sort of um, what the Germans uh, were intending because they also wanted to really see like the potential of these different compounds for use in camouflage or for hiding um, the signatures of the tank. Uh, whether it be radar or whatever. So they examined a lot of different possibilities. And so we'll flip through here. So some more testing. And sort of it's divided by um, really some of the different uh, materials they're using. So here's asbestos, which, of course, uh, back then, people were not nearly as uh, afraid to use asbestos as, in things as they are now. Um, you know, I think anybody who's ever been in an industrial environment, if, if you saw a tank covered in an asbestos compound like that now, it would be a, a major freak out moment as you have to call in health and safety and all that good stuff. Um, waiting trials, and so here we have. So I'll just sort of skip through here because of shellac and varnish. So you can see lots of different data, charts, and different. Um, reports and methods on different materials. So for people interested in chemistry and uh, different materials and what they do, this will might, might be interesting as well. Uh, do, 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 do. I'll skip through here some more. And there were tests on Churchill tanks. Later on, they're also using Cromwell's. Here you can see some of the different patterns for applying it. Um, so you can use kind of like um, this is sort of the German style. It almost looks like you're putting it on with a trowel with like teeth on the edge or like a large comb almost. Um, there's the Churchills that they're using for, for the testing. And skip here ahead a little bit more. Like I said, more data than anybody will probably ever be able to uh, process. Because like I said, I read through it all and, and now that it's time to do the review, I'm just sort of like, oh my God, there was a lot of detail in that book. Um, and then finally, let's see, we'll get to the end here. So a final decision, of course, by 1947, uh, the war had been over for a couple of years, and they realized that while these, this material had uh, certainly had its uses, and they had actually come up with some formulas that proved on the original German uh, recipe, it was decided that, you know, for the post-war environment, it just really wasn't worth pursuing any further as far as applying these to vehicles. Um, in the post-war uh, world. So there's the uh, Cromwell that they used for testing as well. And let's see. Conclusion. And then after that, we get references. So <laughs> these are all the references that Andrew dug into, so pretty impressive the number of letters here that he was able to find and process and turn into a readable book. Good Lord. Um, and then a list of the companies that are involved in, in the work. So, and then here's some reproductions of some of those documents. So certainly a very thorough and um, fact-filled examination of this really relatively uh, obscure topic relating to, uh, I'd say, both German and British World War II and uh, early post-war tank development. So if you're interested in Zimmerit, just, you know, if, just as it was on, on the German tanks, but also on these British efforts, this book is well worth, um, you know, like I said, 1495 is really not bad at all, particularly for 200 pages. And to support guys like Andrew who are putting out these kind of uh, you know, putting the work, the amount of work that goes into this, you know, de deserves to, to be supported and just that are putting out research into, into new avenues rather than just, you know, rehashing the same old stuff that we see again and again, sometimes from some of the larger publishers. So with that, uh, I think that's all I've got to say about British Zimmerit. Um, like I said, 1495 on Amazon, check it out and support uh, the good work that Andrew is doing.
Thank you very much.